There are many speeches that have marked history. Speeches that quickly come to my mind are Winston Churchill's speech to the House of Commons on June 4th, 1940. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. And JFK's inaugural address in and 1961. So my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And no one can forget Ronald Reagan's Brandenburg Gate speech. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Each of these speeches are lessons in how to speak to the public. But no speech has marked me more than the Martin Luther King speech on Capitol Hill. One year, 11 months, and 14 days before my birth, Martin Luther King delivered the I Have a Dream speech. This speech would mark the height of the civil rights movement and in one fell swoop would change the minds of many doubters and solidify the thoughts of those not sure. Now the first time I heard the I Have a Dream speech, I was seven. I was seven and it brought me to tears. So why did it bring me to tears? Apart from the emotional aspect of the speech, what is so captivating about this speech that even someone in the dawn of their life could be touched so indelibly? In this video, I want to examine this powerful speech by taking it apart to see why it was so good at nailing its message. My name is Jacques Gaines. My father was black. My mother was white. May they rest in peace. Let's make something from nothing. On August 28, 1963, a defining moment in the fight for civil rights unfolded as Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his powerful I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom event. Now beyond the speech's historical impact was King's ability to convince through his rhetorical brilliance. So who wrote the speech? Well, contrary to popular belief, the actual words to the I Have a Dream speech was a collaboration between Clarence Jones, Stanley Levison, Martin Luther King, obviously, and other people within the King entourage. Now I mention this because the speech was not only a masterstroke for its delivery, but also in the way it was written. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But that is something that I must say to my people. What was happening on August 28, 1963 in the U.S.? Well, the date marked the height of the civil rights movement. The country was struggling with deeply seated racial inequality and segregation. Blacks were fighting for their fundamental rights and their fundamental freedoms. Now the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom was being held at the Lincoln Memorial with an attendance of no less than 250,000 people. Roy Ottaway Wilkins, John Lewis, and Whitney Young were among the speakers. Martin Luther King was the last to speak. So how and why was the I Have a Dream speech such a masterstroke? Well, put simply, Martin Luther King mastered all rhetorical techniques everyone needs to deliver a compelling message. These devices amplify the power of words and evoke strong emotions in listeners. King's notable strategic choices of repetition, parallelism, and vivid metaphors makes his message unforgettable. So let's go through some of these devices and see how well they were applied. King uses repetition like a sonic hammer, driving his message home with rhythmic cadence, using expressions like, I have a dream and let freedom ring. For instance, at timestamp 1058, King introduces the word dream with the sentence, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. 
Bringing back the word dream nails the idea that this is what the speech will be about from now on. The word dream returns 11 times during the whole speech. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. King also painted his I Have a Dream speech with imagery and symbolic language. Metaphors such as promissory note and the bad check artfully communicated the unfulfilled promises of freedom. This symbolic language transformed the speech into a shared vision, crossing racial boundaries through a common understanding of the dream. They were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note. America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. King's ability to evoke deep emotions with his audience is a testament to his oratory mastery. He fostered empathy and a shared sense of humanity through carefully chosen words and a passionate delivery. The speech is more than an intellectual engagement. It leaves a mark on the hearts of those who hear it. Now, although the speech is filled with idealism, Martin Luther King balances optimism with a statement of the harsh realities of racial justice. By confronting the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination, he grounded the dream in the painful truths of the times while inspiring hope for a brighter tomorrow. Now, this delicate balance elevated the speech beyond rhetoric and made it an influential and chilling commentary on the times. Now, the whole beginning of the speech glorifies the Emancipation Proclamation. A great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves. But then King slams everyone with the ugly truth that in 1963, while repeating the words 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty. Now, here's where I find Martin Luther King gets to everybody. He uses many allusions, drawing from diverse sources such as the Bible, the Constitution, and other famous speeches. Now, the strategic use of these allusions added depth and resonance to King's words by connecting the struggle for civil rights to broader ideals deeply held in American culture. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The this sweltering place. summit of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass. Now, to make sure everyone felt that they were being spoken to, King used inclusive language. By repeatedly using words like we and our, he created a sense of unity, making the dream not only his own, but a collective aspiration for everyone. Now, this inclusive approach made the speech a rallying cry for a diverse America needing to unite. Walk alone, and as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. King's pauses and punctuation points within his speech. Did he ever master this? 
King would allow the audience to absorb and reflect on his words, not always talking. The power is in silence. Well-placed pauses transform the speech into a conversation. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. Now we come to one skill that King was a master at. It's called anaphora, and it's the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of successive clauses. I think it is the thing that amplified the impact of King's speech. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation. Now is the time. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. When we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city. Now these to this day have become memorable mantras, reinforcing key themes and galvanizing the audience. Now, beyond King's rhetorical flair, the speech was a strategic call to action. First, King carefully crafts placement of outright commands like, go back to Mississippi at 1014. He then builds on that call to action, appealing to the audience to return to their communities and demand their rights. This was instrumental in transforming the dream speech into actual change. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech is a timeless masterpiece that resonates to this day. Because of this speech, a nation confidently moved forward in its search for freedom. Because of this speech, Americans gained a better understanding of the realities of the American black. Because of this speech, Americans understood the expediency of taking action. It is because of this speech that I am who I am today without the shame of being born in a mixed race union. Now, before I let you go, I had a few interesting details I saw in this speech while studying it. See if you can check this out. At 2.13, King openly has an angry tone. This note was a promise at all men. Yes, black men as well as white men would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now there are other places in the speech where his tone is less subtle and outright angry. See if you can point them out. And other questions we can reflect on. Do you think this speech was a factor in MLK's winning of the Nobel Prize in 1964? And last but not least, Martin Luther King storms off very quickly at the end of the speech. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Any ideas why? Write these in the comments. A pleasure sharing my findings with you today. Thank you very much for watching. Like, share, subscribe, and don't forget everybody, keep on making something from nothing.